Hello there. Welcome to Moody Institute of Science. Do you know what this is? No, it isn't a model of a flying saucer or a spaceship. But it is an accurate model of the principal carrier in the most amazing transportation system ever devised. It's a red blood cell. Increased in volume 100 trillion times. Through the years, we've studied many things here at the laboratory. But for some time, we've been engaged in our most important study. Life human life. Each new babe born into the world gives us a fresh glimpse into the wonders of God's creation. Here is living sculpture that changes with every passing hour. Here is an architect's dream of perfection. Here is the ultimate in complete automation. Construction, repair, breathing, heartbeat, everything fully automatic. Life is a precious and a wonderful thing. And yet with all its importance, it's amazing how little the average person knows about himself. Today, almost any 10-year-old knows more about the family car and what makes it run than the average adult knows about himself. And by the way, whatever you may happen to know about the family car will help you to understand your own body for there are many amazing similarities. Take a deep breath. Now exhale. That was the intake and the exhaust of a 30 trillion cylinder motor. You see, there are some 30 trillion cells in the human body. And each cell is like a tiny motor. It burns fuel. It requires oxygen to burn the fuel. It gets hot and must be cooled. It gives off an exhaust gas, and it performs work. Think of it. A motor with 30 trillion cylinders. And remember, each of these tiny motors must be continuously supplied day and night throughout your entire lifetime. Even an eight-cylinder motor gets pretty complicated. We put the fuel in the gas tank, the oil in the crankcase, the water in the radiator, the oxygen enters through the air intake, and the exhaust comes out the exhaust pipe. The electrical current for the spark travels through the ignition system. There is a separate supply system for each of these separate functions. Oh, I suppose that the creator could have provided a separate supply line to each cell in the body for each of these functions, but he didn't. Instead, he did something far more wonderful, something an automotive engineer would say is absolutely impossible. He combined them all in a single common system, the bloodstream. And the story of that red liquid which is sent plunging through the arteries and veins of your body with every beat of your heart is the most amazing, the most fabulous, the most fantastic story in the physical universe. If it were possible for you to shrink to the size of a tiny microbe and then enter the bloodstream for a trip through the circulatory system, you would find yourself caught up in a torrent of traffic that would, by comparison, make the busiest freeway look like a lonely desert road. You would see the red cells performing their unbelievable chemical magic. Loads of sugar, Fat, chemicals, and minerals would be speeding from processing plants to delivery points throughout the body. Loads of refuse and waste material would be en route to salvage yards or disposal plants. You would see skilled mechanics hurrying to replace worn out or damaged parts in the cell motors of the body. You would see an amazing traffic control system with stop and go signals at every byway intersection all controlled by an electronic brain so that every pickup and delivery is made at the right place and at just the right time. If, however, in shrinking to the size of a microbe, you turned out to be a harmful bacterium or even a suspicious character, you'd never get into the bloodstream. A ghostly giant would come out through the capillary wall without even making a hole and gobble you up. 
These lively ghosts are the white cells or leukocytes. They form an army of 35 billion police prepared to keep the peace or repel an invasion. You remember we said that each cell of the body is like a tiny motor and the food you eat provides the fuel to keep it running. But it takes more than fuel to make a motor run. Did you know that the motor of your family car uses more than 9,000 gallons of air for every gallon of gasoline? Now, the human body is very efficient in its use of oxygen, but even so, it requires at least four gallons of pure oxygen per hour just to keep your tiny motors idling when your body is at rest. But when we are active, the demand can jump to 75 gallons or more of pure oxygen per hour. This oxygen must be transported from the lungs to the tissue cells throughout the body. The only possible way for oxygen to reach these cells is through the bloodstream. And yet, it was obvious that it couldn't possibly be carried as a gas. That would be fatal. If you inject air into the bloodstream, a vapor lock develops. The heart stops beating. That's the reason why a physician is so careful to remove all of the air from a hypodermic syringe before making an injection. The answer to this riddle was discovered in the wonderful chemistry of the red blood cell. The molecule of hemoglobin is the largest and most complex yet discovered in nature. In each molecule, there are 3,032 atoms of carbon, 4,812 atoms of hydrogen, and so on. And then, tucked away down here in the middle of this atomic jungle, are four little iron atoms, atoms upon which your very life depends. As the red cell passes through your lungs, it picks up a load of oxygen and converts it into a solid by an instantaneous rusting of these iron atoms. But the process is also reversible. Your blood can unrust just as quickly. When the oxygen reaches the cell that needs it, it is changed back into a gas and delivered to the cell ready for use. But on the return trip, your blood isn't loafing. It's performing another task that is just as vital and even more complex than carrying oxygen to the cell. It is carrying the exhaust gas from the cell motors of your body. Now, we all know that the exhaust from an automobile is a dangerous thing. Well, the exhaust from the tissue cells of your body can be just as deadly. Now, the exhaust gas from the tissue cells is principally carbon dioxide. It is a colorless, odorless, invisible, tasteless gas. This beaker is filled with carbon dioxide gas. The gas remains in the beaker because it's heavier than air. And for the same reason, it can be poured almost like a liquid. The carbon dioxide extinguishes the candles very quickly. And it could snuff out your life just as quickly if it weren't for another chemical miracle performed by the bloodstream. In many ways, carbon dioxide is a more difficult substance than oxygen for the blood to handle. Like oxygen, it must be converted from a gas into a solid. But in addition, it must have very special treatment to render it harmless in the bloodstream, to keep it from poisoning the bloodstream. Now, in one of the fastest reactions known to chemistry, the carbon dioxide is snatched from the tissues of the body by the red blood cell and then hydrated to form carbonic acid. But neither the red cell nor the bloodstream can tolerate this acid, so it must be neutralized instantly. And for this purpose, the blood has been storing up potassium, the fastest acting acid fighter on the chemist's shelf. This is a weak solution of carbonic acid.
after the acid is neutralized, the red cell dumps it into the bloodstream, where it combines with the salt and the plasma to form, of all things, ordinary baking soda. In this safe and harmless form, it is carried through the veins to the lungs. But here another problem arises. Our lungs aren't equipped to exhale baking soda. So the red cell goes to work again. In a split second, it collects the stuff and puts it all back together again as carbon dioxide, passes it through the capillary wall into the lungs, and we exhale it into the air. And remember, it must do all of this quickly enough so that there is time left over for the red cell to pick up another load of oxygen and convert it into a solid before it reaches the end of a tiny capillary less than 1 50th of an inch in length. To expect a red blood cell to do all of this is like asking a man to engrave the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin as he passes that pin after being shot out of a cannon. Yes, your life hangs by a very slender but by a very wonderful thread. Now, of course, the most publicized part of the circulatory system is the heart. We could easily run out of superlatives in describing this fabulous little two-cylinder pump. In the realm of efficient design, it's in a class by itself. Each side of the heart has its own pair of valves. The mitral valve resembles a parachute. Delicate cords, called chordae tendini, are fastened to the edge of the valve and to the heart wall. When the cusps billow out to close the opening, the cords are just the right length to let the valve go closed, but no further. The aortic valve is of a different design. Three small cusps form pockets around the inside of the artery wall. We can learn a lot about the heart by studying it in this fashion, but there is vital information that can be obtained only by looking directly inside an actual human heart while it is beating. That sounds impossible, doesn't it? Well, until recently, it has been impossible. But here at the Moody Institute of Science, working in cooperation with a famous heart surgeon, we have designed a means of viewing the heart under these exact conditions. This is an actual human heart. Just a few hours ago, it was pumping blood through the body of a living human being. Its owner willed his heart to medical science that we might study it and gain new knowledge of its living function, knowledge that someday may save the lives of others. The machine causes the heart to beat and to perform normally as a fluid pump, just as it does in the body. We have installed viewing ports over the valves so that we may study their action at close range. This is the mitral valve of the left heart. Observe how rhythmically it opens and closes, permitting the heart to fill and then hold firmly against the pressure as the fluid is expelled. This is the same valve as it appears from inside the heart. Note the delicate cords that restrain the parachute-like cusps. This is the aortic valve, with its three semi-luminar cusps sealing tightly against the return flow. Let's take a look at the underside of this same valve. With this machine, we can study the heart under a variety of conditions. We can increase or decrease the pulse rate. By restricting the flow coming from the heart, we can raise the blood pressure and then observe the action of the heart and valves, just as they would function in a patient who has high blood pressure. By restricting the flow entering the heart, we can see what happens when low blood pressure is the problem.
If we restrict the flow sufficiently, we can simulate the condition of a person in shock. The heart is pumping quite well, isn't it? Yes, but this heart has always worked well. It served its owner for 85 years. And during that time, it beat 3 billion, 400 million times and pumped enough blood to fill a good-sized lake. All this without a single shutdown for repairs. A pump fashioned of the finest steel by the most skilled craftsmen could not begin to match the endurance of the human heart. Of course, like any tissue of the body, the heart is subject to its share of disease and injury. A normal, healthy heart can stand an enormous amount of work, but disease can cause serious damage. In recent years, amazing techniques have been developed for actually making repairs on a human heart. Oh, so far I haven't heard of anyone taking his heart in to have the valves ground, but believe it or not, damaged heart valves have been replaced with plastic valves, just like this. The valve is inserted in the descending aorta, just above the heart. This is an actual X-ray motion picture of such a valve that has been functioning in a patient for some time. I hope that you never need an artificial valve in your heart. But if you do, you'll be glad to know that uh, a plastic valve like this costs about $85. Of course, there's usually an installation charge. And there should be, for heart surgery is one of the most exacting and difficult of all professions. Trying to perform a delicate operation on a human heart while it is beating is much like trying to grind the valves or tighten the connecting rods on the motor of your car while it is running. Obviously, the job would be much easier if the heart could be stopped during an operation. A great deal of engineering and medical skill has been devoted to solving this problem. A number of heart-lung machines have been designed to take over the task of pumping the blood while repairs are being made on the heart. One of the first really practical heart-lung machines was designed by Dr. Peter Salisbury, renowned physiologist. During an operation on the heart, the heart is actually stopped, and the machine both pumps and breathes for the patient during the operation. It is comforting to know that a damaged heart can be repaired. As we all know, hearts have even been replaced. But to those who have considered the heart the mystical wellspring of life, it, it is a bit confusing and somewhat disconcerting to find that the heart, wonderful and amazing though it may be, is just a pump. A pump which, for a time at least, can be replaced by a machine. Have you ever wondered about the peculiar shape of the red blood cell? Someone has described it as a cross between a donut and a pancake. Now, if you or I had been designing the red blood cell, we probably would have made it spherical where a sphere is the simplest of all compact shapes and in many ways the most efficient. It has much greater volume than the biconcave disc of the red blood cell. It's the strongest of all shapes, and it's the shape that would pass through the intricate maze of the blood vessels with greatest ease. But it has one fatal weakness. It wouldn't work. Here at the laboratory, we've made models of several possible shapes for the red blood cell. We've cut them so that we can observe their cross-section as they're immersed in a colored liquid and thus determine the rate at which the liquid is absorbed. With the sphere, absorption is rapid at first, but near the center, the process slows to a snail's pace. It is obvious that a spherical cell would be much too slow for the job. Of course, the most obvious solution would be to flatten the sphere into a disk. And in actual tests, it is clear that this does solve the problem of rapid absorption. The disc has adequate speed, but not enough volume. The ideal red cell shape is one that would combine volume, speed, and durability. 
Now, it isn't necessary for us to guess what this ideal shape should be. It can be determined scientifically and mathematically. Starting with the laws of gas infusion, and then applying the principles of advanced calculus, it is possible to derive a formula that will give maximum volume with maximum speed in absorbing gases. This is that formula. It allows for all the variables we have just described. The laws of gas infusion, volume, surface area, and time. The men here at the laboratory worked for several weeks with this formula to establish a relatively few points indicating the ideal shape. These seem to coincide with the actual shape of the red cell, but we needed more complete and reliable evidence. So we submitted the problem to the Applied Science Department of the International Business Machine Corporation. Dr. Edgar Smith, IBM mathematician, set up the problem for solution on one of the giant research computers. All that remains is to push the right button and 10,000 things happen faster than we can describe and the answer to our problem appears on the oscilloscope screen. This is the cross-sectional shape of the actual red blood cell. And this is a photograph of the shape on the IBM research computer derived from the formula for an ideal red blood cell. The fact that the red blood cell turns out to be the one perfect ideal shape demands an explanation. And to me, the only adequate explanation is intelligent design. But the question arises, whose intelligence is involved? Well, one thing is certain, it wasn't man's intelligence. We had nothing to do with it. But there it is, the ideal perfect shape. It would seem that if a man wants to believe in God, he has, just within the red blood cells of his body, at least 30 trillion very good reasons for doing so. To grasp the full significance of a subject, it is often necessary for us to change our perspective. To view the subject as related to the past or to the future. This is particularly true with the story of the bloodstream. Looking into the past, we find that one of the strangest cases in medical history is closely tied to the subject. This medical case involves the death of a president of the United States. The facts surrounding that death are almost impossible to believe. You'll find the case well documented in the Virginia Medical Monthly. It is the account of the death of George Washington. December 12, 1799 was a day of rain, snow, and chilling wind at Mount Vernon. Despite the weather, the general, who seemed in excellent health, followed his daily habit of riding about the farm from 10 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon. The next morning, he complained of a sore throat. He stayed indoors until early afternoon. Then he went out to mark some trees to be cut down. At 3 o'clock the next morning, Washington called his wife, saying that he thought he was having an attack of ague, or fever. At daylight, an attempt was made to administer a mixture of molasses, butter, and vinegar. Then the overseer of the farm, who had some experience in bloodletting, was summoned. A pint of blood was taken, but with no relief. Dr. James Crake arrived at Mount Vernon at 11 o'clock. He says, discovering the case to be highly alarming and foreseeing the fatal tendency of the disease, two consulting physicians were immediately sent for. In the interim were employed two copious bleedings, but without any perceptible advantage. Upon the arrival of the first of the consulting physicians, it was agreed to try the result of another bleeding, when about 32 ounces were drawn without the smallest apparent alleviation of the disease. An observer at the bedside noted that at the last, the blood came slow and thick. Now it is quite probable that the general had a serious throat infection. 
But it is equally obvious that the treatment he was given could have proved fatal even if he had been in perfect health. Now, it doesn't seem possible, but this was the accepted medical treatment of the day, and it continued to be so for many years afterward. Today, such a treatment would be considered homicide. And even in Washington's day, there was no excuse for it. Why? Beside the bed as the general died was a copy of the Bible, the Word of God. And in it were these words. The book of Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And again in the 14th verse, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Then later, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Now, these are not isolated passages. The Bible probably has more to say about the blood and its importance than any other book ever written outside of a textbook on hematology. Maybe people in George Washington's day didn't know about the blood, but at least they could have believed. It is impossible to estimate the number of lives that have been sacrificed through ignorance and superstition, through failure to believe the simple, clear-cut statements of the Word of God, statements that have been there for thousands of years. But the toll in spiritual death is even more tragic and more inexcusable. The Bible has far more to say about the importance of the blood to spiritual life, to our eternal relationship to God. Only in this case, it's not our blood that's important. It's his blood shed for you and for me. Do you find this difficult to believe? It's the central theme of the Bible. You'll find it stated literally hundreds of times, from the first to the last. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And again, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Do you find this difficult to understand? Some people do. And yet it's so simple. Remember, the life of the flesh is in the blood. This merely means that the Son of God gave his life to pay the death penalty for your sin and for mine. For the wages of sin is death. Now the question you must decide is, is this merely religious superstition or is it actual scientific fact? If it is fact, it is the most important fact in the entire universe for your eternal destiny hangs upon your acceptance or your rejection of it. Uh -huh.